Welcome to the Wild Ones Podcast, episode 22. I am Jimmy. This is Francis, and this is a show where we chat about bike stuff. What have you been doing? I went to Ruler Live, once known as Ruler Classic, in London for the day on Thursday. Why did they change the name? I don't know. Hmm. That's an odd question. No, it's not. It's a valid question. Because they you just... just- Highlighted that they changed the name. I want to know why. I will take a guess at it's because they have live famous people talking. They've always had that. I know. And thus they've made the name more appropriate for that. Perhaps. More appealing. So Ruler Live, as it's now known, is a bike show in London, which happens every single year, uh, technically sponsored, I guess, by the publication Ruler magazine. And they have famous people talking on the stage, they have loads of industry and bike stuff, and usually they'll have something that's like outrageously expensive or outrageously fancy or new tech and fancy things that are coming through. It's like it's like a it's it's a bike show of like fancy stuff. Do you say that's fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. Did they have very expensive stuff this time? I missed it, and I was I had a bit of FOMO. But not that much, because I've done it a few times. <laughs> uh, the two significant things, I would say, from this show were, um, one, Lotus have made an e-bike that costs £20,000 and is based on their track bike with weird fins and things in all over the place. I had a chat with them. They claim they've taken my details and they're going to loan us one of these, one of... 136 bikes in the world, hopefully in the new year, so we can have a little play around with it for a video. Yes, please, Lotus. Yes, please, Lotus. Lotus, if you are listening, which you definitely are not, please make sure this happens. You have my details. Uh, and the other thing is a £50,000 bike. Oh, did you, we get that one as well? No, I was too scared to talk what to What one's him. that? £50,000, Francis, <laughs> for a bike. That would be one of those weird prototype, uh, like McLaren do one, and it, it's just... Those, they don't, they're not really bikes. It is really a bike. They're meant to be put on a plinth. I think it is a legit bike. It's very rideable. It's made by Jay Lavanac. Is that how you pronounce it? Lavanac. And it's a collab with Aston Martin, the British car manufacturer. And it's allegedly the first boltless bike. Because I've always wanted a boltless bike. <laughs> Hate hey, those bolts. Nick was very upset with it. So bike mechanic Nick, he was at the show with me. Uh, he was no, most upset by the fact that this boltless bike had a band-on front mech with a bolt in it. <laughs> so it's not, it's not even a boltless bike? It's not a boltless bike. They failed. It's nearly a boltless I bike. I don't want that one anymore. I only want the Lotus one. But I don't understand. Why didn't they just do it one by? Yeah. Or, or even use like a classified hub or something like that. So it's technically two by. Yeah. And then it's boltless. Legit boltless rather than 50 grand for an almost boltless bike. I don't have any particular exciting... Interesting about our 3D printed titanium lugs. I feel like we're going to see a lot of this coming from bike brands over the next couple of years. 3D printed bike bits. Can they, can they do 3D printed carbon? Do you know? I don't know. I would have thought so. Mm. Haven't Ribble just released a 3D printed titanium bike or something? Uh, I believe so, yes. I'm not, I don't think it was at the show. I think it's not officially launched yet but they've kind of like teased it you can 3d print carbon i remember asking the question to our friend rob the carbon expert he does carbon bike repairs the, I think the biggest company in the uk who do it and he i remember asking him if you could 3d print a hole frame 3d print a hole a <laughs> hole like a hole in the floor can well, you 3d vacuum. print one <laughs> a black hole <laughs> We just destroy the world by 3D printing a hole. <laughs> now, 3D printing a whole frame, a whole bike frame, um, because then you could specify exactly how thick the carbon is and all that. And there was a reason that I can't remember as to why not. You shouldn't. Okay. Well, you can 3D print titanium. Yes. And I think we are going to see, obviously there's, there's already saddles that are 3D printed, helmets maybe, or bits of helmets that are 3D printed. Um, oh, actually, yeah, you had a 3D printed helmet, didn't you? Yeah. From Lucy's mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, still got it. So helmets are 3D printed. Saddles I've seen 3D printed. Titanium lugs 3D printed. 
And I think we are going to see, I think this is going to be the next cycling revolution is 3D printing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Rob Quirk uses it a lot. We have a frame builder friend who makes beautiful steel bikes and he often 3D prints lugs. the joints, the lugs, mm. yeah. And then he attaches normal tubes in between. Yeah. It makes it custom, makes it feel, uh, it's exciting to see that on a, a, a on the website, isn't it? 3D printed all. It actually makes it cheaper in terms of manufacturing as well, I think. My dad's an engineer and we went to, went to one of his engineering mates to get a piece machined. And he said the machined version was something like 22 quid and the 3D printed version was pennies because you don't actually have to be operating a machine. If you can, if you can set something away and have it print a whole production run, then it's automated, so it's cheaper. If, if I remember, he was... Yeah, he he was basically saying, well, you program machine and just let it run overnight and you walk back in the next day and you've got all your stuff. So presumably this will be marketed as a premium bespoke product, but it's actually potentially cheaper to manufacture. It sounds so good. Innovation. <laughs> I can't believe you haven't mentioned the most exciting thing about Ruler Classic, which uh, you've said to us about a thousand times since you got back. What, my new best mate? Your new best friend. <laughs> Whose name, I call him Perry. Yeah, he's known as Perry. What's his real name? Perder Apgwynedd. Whatever Jimmy just said. <laughs> <laughs> that guy is the... Commentator for Tour de France in Welsh language. <laughs> and also the guitarist for Pendulum. <laughs> the drum and bass band of many years. I, I would like there to have been a moment there where we rock out and we drop some Pendulum in, but we don't have the rights to be able to do that. Oh, we do. They're on Licked. So we could pay like 10 quid and use the song. Can we? Yep. Their, their whole library is on Licked. But can you use it for a podcast? I don't want to risk it. Oh yeah, maybe not. YouTube only. Yeah, maybe. Mm. So let's just, we'll, we'll skip that. You could probably ask him. But I do, if, you, if you're listening, can we... License all of your music yes, ever? Yes, please. <laughs> and just use it in our videos. Only, only Pendulum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was very good. Um, I, I instantly had a connection with him. And I think it's probably because we're both Welsh and we're both rock stars. So... <laughs> yeah i love him he's gonna he's he's, well, he's gonna come and uh guest on our podcast at some point next year is he mm -hmm. is he gonna replace you or me or emily well preferably you because i get on with him better than you you just love it. You, it's you and your best with us both being rock stars we just we just get on and welsh you know in other news did you see chris Froome has accidentally been riding the wrong bike setup i did yes he's been riding for the Israel Premier Tech team since 2021 and hasn't been on great form since joining. So this might be a, just an excuse. But the latest news is that his position on his Team Factor bike has actually been off by over three centimetres this whole time. And he says it's been causing him problems in races. How do you not notice this? He apparently took his Team bike and his old Team Sky Pinarello to a specialist who noticed the very big discrepancies. Do you need an, a specialist to tell you this three centimetre is different on a bike? It sounds to me like it's all just excuses and bump. It's weird, isn't it? There's no way that he's been riding a bike for that many years with a three centimetre difference and it's actually made this like huge difference. Bear in mind, this is his job. His saddle height was off by one centimetre as well. If I raise my saddle by one centimetre, it is like night and day massively noticeable. Granted, I'm smaller than Chris Froome, so maybe the actual difference is less, but it's more for me. <laughs> That's bonkers. I've got issues with this because some, uh, what I have learned the older I get is that some people are micro adjusters and some people are macro adjusters. So if my, so I ride your saddle height, which is about a centimeter and a half higher than my saddle height on my bikes. And you know, granted, if I was doing a, a 10 hour bike ride, it would probably have an impact. But the stuff that we're doing around here and testing bikes and things, I don't even notice. Like, this just seems like bump to me. I mean, it's always a, a, a range you can operate within. Bike fitting is a game of centimeters, not millimeters. Mm -hmm. So there's, you can, you can operate within a certain range on your saddle height. But he's clearly blaming this for his performances. But also, I think you actually hit a, a nail on the head there in that he's really tall, isn't he? 
So proportionately, I'm, what was it? Three centimeters longer and then one centimeter higher. It's less, less of a deal for yeah. a tall person. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Like yeah. percentage wise, yeah. it is less significant yeah, than yeah. That, that range would be for us. Yeah. I messaged James, Bike Fit James, yeah. about this for a quote. He just replied, don't let f***ing physios touch your f***ing bike fit. And then he sent me a gif, GIF. of Bert. A from, GIF. A gif. A gif. <laughs> of Bert from Bert and Ernie being really angry. After chatting with him and hearing the bike fits that he's had to fix from professional team, like riders from professional teams who've come in to see him. I mean, I won't name any names. There was one guy who came in, world tour rider, and he changed his frame size by two sizes. He was on, it was like completely wrong. Yep. So I think there's a lack of bike fitting expertise in the world tour, despite them being professionals. They have physios involved with the teams, but they don't have a bike fitter. It's, it's, and it's, a, t it's a different thing. It's definitely a space that has um, prioritized performance. So power generation and aerodynamics over comfort. Totally. Like that, that's always been the thing about that level. Yeah. You know, you, as it should be, as it should be. Well, I mean, what, but do you, unless you want long longevity in your career or you don't want to end up with back problems later in your life and things like that, there's like, there's a lot to be said for outside after your, after your cycling is done. That is a, a big, important thing, surely. Like if you're riding a position that means you are going to have knackered knees or I guess, it, I guess if you, uh, broaden it to more than just cycling or just professional sports people mm -hmm. if you're doing stuff to your body that means like, like think about gymnasts like the stress and load they put on their bodies like and and top end runners their feet are going to be like riddled full of arthritis and their knees and their joints and everything like should professional sports people be sacrificing their bodies in later life or even now for the purpose of a couple of percent. I think most of them are very much prepared to do so. I know. And and I think that is brutal. Mm -hmm. The brutal reality of sport. Mm -hmm. On the topic of blaming his equipment, Chris Froome has blamed Israel, Premier Tech's equipment and mechanical issues before for poor performances. He didn't blame them this time, maybe because he's learned a lesson because it was a bit of a war of words. And the core owner of the team said that he wasn't very good value for money after he said that they were crap, so. I mean, it's a tricky, as a professional sports person on a pro team which has sponsors, part of your job is to just say nice things about the sponsors. That is, it's, you, you are a spokesperson for the things you're riding and the bike you're riding and the kit you're wearing and the helmet and glasses and all that stuff. You should, you know, doing this will compromise that, that job completely. Here's a question, who's responsible for getting that correct he didn't blame the team this time but is it his responsibility to make sure his position is correct is it the team's responsibility i would like to think it was his I if, agree. if i was a professional athlete i would be going well my fit is important to me even if i have to spend money on getting the bike fit i'm happy with then i would do that especially if i was on a million quid a year you just go all right okay bike fit james I'm flying you out to Monaco, you do my bike fits. But also like as a normal person, when you get a new bike, the first thing you do is you get your old bike, your original bike, and you measure it up and then you adjust your new one to the height of your old one. Literally, yeah. Literally. I think if you're a world tour pro and you're pushing that many watts and you're that, you have that amount of conditioning, it masks a lot of bike fit problems. So a lot of riders don't consider, or they don't see a need to see a bike fitter until something goes wrong, until there's a problem. So he was, he's been suffering with back pain, apparently, on longer rides. Yeah. He didn't know whether it was just because he's 38. Yes, well, 38 definitely. and ridden a position which for a long time you can get away with it, but later in life you can't, can you? So, I don't see why a physio isn't the appropriate person to do a bike fit. Uh, ask James, get him on this podcast. He hates that physios touch people's bike positions. Hmm. On paper, they are significantly more qualified to be able to do it. Well, on paper, sure. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. This story was sent to us by Ryan, who said, I'm far from a professional, but it just seems sloppy that this could happen without anyone realizing. Mm -hmm. It does seem odd, doesn't it? Who's he been talking to? Did he say this in an interview? Yeah, it was an interview with Cycling News. Weird. It's a weird thing to bring up. 
It's odd, isn't it? Yeah. Does he need to just... Um, Go on, say it. Pipe down. Pipe down and re- retire gracefully is what I wrote on the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Savage. <sighs> Probably. Nah. Well, you know, like... I'd still like to see him do well. I would too. Mm. Yeah. Is he the same? So he's the same age as... Is he 38? Yes. God, he looks about 45, doesn't he? His contract expires in 2025. Wow. Wow. I think he was a, um, a little bit frustrated because he wasn't getting selected. I think he, he had a big crash, didn't he? At some point. And then yeah. he kind of hasn't really got back into the game after that. Can I give you a fact about Chris Froome? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's, well, it is about Chris Froome, but it's kind of more about Nick Vieri. One of Nick Vieri's claims to fame. So he used to be an elite bike racer at junior level in South Africa, where he used to race against Chris Froome. And he always talks about how he's how Chris Froome used to be rubbish as a junior, and Nick used to beat him all the time. So Nick Vieri is is better than Chris Froome. Speculation, it's not verified, has beaten Chris Froome more than once. His bike fits better as well. Did you see Rafa posted a twelve million pound loss? I did not. That sounds like a lot of money to me. <laughs> it is, yeah. You can do a lot of things with that. <laughs> How can a business continually post losses yet still exist? Um, and not be like, ah, we're going to go out of business straight away. Some, well, how does that work? Some of it will be accounting, mm-hmm. how they account for things. And therefore, if they post a loss and move things around in certain ways, they don't have to pay corporation tax. Uh, some of it will be because their owners and primary investors are very rich and will just keep giving them more money mm-hmm. to keep the, the business going. They're owned by the Walmart family. Is that right? It's a, 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 a it's basically an investment trust set up by, I think, two of the grandchildren of the Walmart empire. So they're like mega billionaires and as part, they're, they're cyclists and Rafa to them is just a bit of fun on the side. It's not a primary investment for them, I believe. Um, what we do know is Rafa has posted a loss for six years in a row, um, even though their turnover, so the turnover in 2023 was 118 million pounds and they ran a loss. That is wild, isn't it? That's crazy. They are without a doubt one of the biggest cycling brands in the world. And I'm not talking about apparel, I'm talking about like brands. They're massive. They're absolutely monumentally huge. Um, so last year's pre-tax loss was 10.5 million. 7 million lost the year before that. Um, it's, well, yeah, it's, it seems bonkers, doesn't it? Do you think the brand has changed since the acquisition? I don't think it's necessarily since the acquisition, but the brand has changed. Yeah, since the, since the, the start when it was kind of, a new, quite cool thing. You didn't see well, they were just an imagery indie. or marketing the way they were doing it. They, they were a small indie brand doing perfume adverts in cycling. Hmm. And now they're one of the biggest financial organizations within cycling. But, you know... At that scale, things have to change. You can't you can't be the same as what you were when you're tiny. It's yeah. just not possible because you've got you know 500 members of staff and operations all over the world, and your supply chain has to be able to handle 120 million pounds worth of sales rather than one million pounds worth of sales. Mm-hmm. So you have to make sacrifices and changes in various places. They, you know, they've done a lot of good stuff. They've got a hell of a lot of people into cycling. They Their range is absolutely monumentally huge. I haven't seen it of late. I know there has been questions on quality over the last few years. Um, I would imagine they're clever enough to have addressed that, but I don't know. That's speculation. It always looks good from the outside. Well, it's just plain, isn't it? Um, no, nah, like if you, the Legion thing came out recently. Have you seen they've done an inside-out jersey? No. Do, not inside-out. Dual, what's this like two way reversible? Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, they do a reversible jersey, one side doesn't have pockets, right? So you'd wear that as the aero side, and then you can flip it around. It's a completely different design that has pockets for training. In. Loads of people have done that over the years, have they? Mm. Let me know before. Plenty of times. Mm. There was actually a brand, I can't, like a little indie, London, maybe a London indie, and all of their jerseys that was their thing reversible jerseys. Reversible, mm. I like that idea. Yeah. I have a jumper which is reversible. 
Well, every th- everything's reversible. Uh, yeah. Like the Fresh Prince's blazer. And your pants. My pants? Mm. Well, you can reverse your pants so they can last for th- two weeks rather than one day. A genius idea. Yeah. Just yeah. keep doing it for two weeks. Mm. That's how it works. That's like flipping your duvet cover around. <laughs> Get yeah. more days out of it. So, yeah. <laughs> more months. More months. <laughs> I think one of Rafa's main problems, and I know that was something that they were trying to address when the takeover happened, was that people were relying so heavily on their discounted stuff. Like, you know how they did the archive sales and they do the archive sales in person and stuff. And I think they sort of recognized that they weren't selling very much at full price anymore. And I don't know whether that's something they've been able to address, but I know they were trying to. There, w- there was definitely a point where anyone we knew that had Rafa either had it for free or 50% off. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, they, they then clawed it all back in house, didn't they? Where they want, they, they decided to, they were selling, I think even there was a point where Withle was selling Rafa um, and they pulled everything in house and tried to limit the reduction or having to sell stuff, uh, sale stuff off, sell stuff at cheap. And that was then where they introduced cheaper lines as well. Because before that, the only jersey you could get was 110 quid up to like 160 quid or something rather. And then they introduced the core range, which if you actually look at it and you know garments, there isn't really a difference between the core jersey and the expensive jersey. They're, they're comparable fabrics in terms of where they sit in how they're manufactured. The garments are essentially the same. There's obviously different fits and things like that, but the cheap jersey is the same as the expensive jersey. And this is something that we've seen a lot in, as as Emily and myself have an apparel brand and have done for the last eight years or whatever it is, what's most notable is there's a minimum standard that is a good jersey. And that minimum standard is the same as a jersey that's very, very expensive. There isn't really any difference between some of the jerseys that you can get for 40, 50 quid and ones that you can get for 200 quid, really. I think the only difference is the psychology of um, marketing. Yeah, expensiveness. I, I, I've we've we have spoken to someone and they've been talking about the quality of a Panomal jersey, and they've been holding it. They've been, I think they were wearing it at the time, and they were like, "Just look at this print," and we know exactly how it's manufactured. It's it's literally a very very standard jersey, good quality, but standard. You know, not two hundred pounds. Doesn't need to be, but. It's the psychology of premium appeals to people, you know? Yeah. That's how it goes. Interestingly, off the back of the chat that we had last week about pricing, someone wrote in saying, um, a hot take here, no cycling jersey should cost more than 50 US dollars, period. Can't understand why they start from 80 to 100 US dollars for the simplest of jerseys. I can buy a Nike running shirt for 30 US dollars and be perfectly okay. The most expensive it is, is 60 so why the hell is a cycling jersey 100 us dollars i don't get it i to an extent agree and that was exactly why we set up atticus um there there is a minimum standard and i i think most of it really comes down to fabric there are certain fabrics that are just hideous and they're typically 100 percent polyester they don't have stretch in them they uh warm when they shouldn't be that there's some fabrics that are just hideous and typically the cheaper end are those fabrics but you know we proved it like you can have a jersey which is or or bib shorts that are comparable to the most expensive out there but half the price however what he's saying is he doesn't think it should be more than 50 us dollars which is 40 pounds so that is that's double that's half the price of what we are selling for as well and i actually think a lot of this is down to manufacturing as well and I think we talked about it last week like you know you say something is for horses and it's double the price if we speak to a cycling manufacturer we wouldn't be able to sell stuff for 40 pounds and make a profit because we wouldn't get it that cheap and you know if you're looking at Nike the buying power that they have they can probably get stuff dead cheap and they're probably manufacturing in places where wages aren't a lot Mm -hmm. but I mean from our perspective we would not be able to run a business selling stuff that cheap well not meeting our minimum standards of quality. The the only way we would be able to do it is to make it out of a fabric that we wouldn't want yeah. to wear and we would probably make about 50 pence on it, if that. 
people are looking at jerseys from decathlon and places like that but again it's buying power isn't it they're buying so many of them mm -hmm. that unfortunately a small business cannot cannot produce a jersey no now on to our big question of the week what are the best rides you've ever done try start you can start I actually talk about this one quite a lot. I was telling my new best mate, Perry, about it. Back in the day, me and Chris used to ride, Chris Hall, we used to like ride bikes together a lot, like nearly every day. He would literally commute with me back to my house so we could get extra miles in and things like that. I used to ride them all the time. And on a handful of occasions in the summer, we both had single speed bikes with baskets on the front. And I'd meet him after work in literally like jean shorts and a t-shirt. And we used to just literally just ride and we'd get to a point where we're like left or right, right. And we would just do it for like five or six hours and always finish. Funny enough, where Ruler Live was, which is why I was, why I was thinking about it. We'd was finish. It Shoreditch? Well, Truman Brewery. Yes. Uh, end of Brick Lane. Mm -hmm. So we would always end up on Brick Lane. We'd probably get a bagel from Bagel Bake, go down to the Truman Brewery, buy a couple of tinnies and we'd sit on a curb having a can of beer and our bagel and then go our separate ways back home and Aww. it was it was always just it was just it was just like the for me exactly what cycling is meant to be just riding having fun having a chat with your mates hanging out best rides i've ever done oh, fair enough thank you chris simple but effective you got anything the, the best ride i have ever done and i don't know if it would be the same if i went back but the first ever bike packing trip i did first ever tour bike tour i did was through death valley it was the most incredible riding I've ever done. One of the best descents I've ever done. There was almost no cars. You can see for absolutely miles. We did it in the middle of summer and it was a record high temperature year as well. So it was in American numbers, like 115 degrees, it was like almost 50 degrees centigrade. And we had to wake up at three o'clock in the morning to start riding because it was so hot. And then we could see behind us the the sun was rising and you can see it coming over the valley and the line on the ground of the sun just coming towards you behind us. So it was all that pressure of like, oh, when the sun hits, it's going to be really hot. So we wanted to get a lot of it done before then. The light was beautiful. Um, we, I was about to say we flew a drone, but that would be illegal in the national park. So we definitely did not fly a drone. And it was just a memory that stuck with us forever. Bear in mind, immediately after that ride, we cycled into and through Yosemite Valley, which is an incredible national park in the USA as well. But it didn't even come close. See, so you were with Bike Fit James, weren't you? Yeah. Didn't he nearly die? He got in... That was before. Oh, that was before. That was going through a place called Kelso, right. which is near Baker and Barstow. I think in between Baker and Barstow, there was a point it was just as hot as the Death Valley days. It's where we learned our lesson. And... Yeah, James Gone. He was the least, he was extremely fit at this point, but he was the least fit of the three of us. So he was struggling, you know, on the climbs, he was suffering more. And water stopped working. We were singing that song from Waterboy. Water sucks. It really, really sucks <laughs> because it doesn't work anymore. And the Gatorade was the only thing that would make us feel better. You know, I guess it had some electrolytes in and it was a little bit sweet. But you would drink water and Gatorade. it would do absolutely nothing. Yeah, that. <laughs> and it was, it was not, it was not working. It was not hydrating us. And you'd be getting these weird shivers because you're so hot. Like it's the one of the stages of like overheating. Sorry, this sounds like hell. This is one of your favorite rides. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the same, Emily. It was amazing. It's like the danger factor just added a bit of. These are the things you remember in life. Fair. Is it is it like a cathartic thing where it wasn't good at the time, but it is looking back? Like, did were you there thinking like, wow, this is amazing. This is the best thing ever. No, it was. I, we were thinking that the whole way through. Okay. I mean, there were points where we were getting really hot in that Kelso day, particularly because we it caught us off. We did two hundred miles that day, and we shouldn't have even planned for over one hundred and fifty because you're out in the sun for that long and the heat for that long. Bear in mind, it's like the the sunset. It, dark we go for di walk to dinner and no one walks in america <laughs> around there at least we walk to a restaurant and it's 35 degrees it's just so hot even in the dark it sounds it doesn't happen here like hell it was it was amazing should i add my next one now add your next one riding 
with Emily in the Pennines, the North Pennines, which is about 30 miles in west, southwest, uh, in the first phases of lockdown. Mm-hmm. It was it was bliss because there was just nothing. Well, there's there's hardly anything there anyway, but there was even less stuff. And it was just it was just quiet and tranquil and all of the roads were had nothing on and the sheep were chill and we were chill because we didn't have to work for a small period of time or n- not as much because we had no stock to sell. <laughs> uh, and it was just it was just pure bliss. I think a lot of cyclists probably had a it was kind of that period of time where it was like, oh, so this is what the world could be like. <laughs> so surreal. Mm. I'm, I was in London at that time and riding into central London. I remember there was a day where for, for some reason I was spending time with Dan Hughes and I can't remember what it was. It was like a work thing. And we had to social distance and stuff where we were allowed to ride together and we were just riding around town getting these shots. And it was like the scene from 28 Days Later. Just no one. Yeah. Absolutely no one. I think that was probably one of my favorite rides as well. And I think what that shows is that it's a mindset rather than where you are or what the ride is. I mean, it's nice if it's nice scenery and the Pennines is lovely, but it's like, it's on our doorstep. It's, you know, we could go out and do that today. But isn't that nice that your favorite ride is somewhere so close? Mm-hmm. It is. Am I allowed to say my second favorite? Is it your second favorite or is it your another favorite? Uh, Both. Okay. Vietnam. With the same guys, James and Lawrence, we cycled from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh. And the middle section, it was a bit of a, when we first landed, it was a baptism of fire because the first time I had been cycling around thousands of other two-wheeled vehicles, all with zero, uh, like the tra- like traffic has different rules in Southeast Asia and like Vietnam in particular, that's where we were. And it flows like water. Once you get the hang of it, It's fine, but when you're first there, it is a shock because there's just stuff going on everywhere and there's people driving two centimeters away from you. But then when you get the hang of it, it really does. You can just, you just have to go and you go with the flow of the traffic and they're very conscious of other two-wheeled vehicles there. So even the truck drivers, because they're so used to like loads of mopeds everywhere, loads of little motorbikes that people on bicycles it's not hard, you know, they, they spot you. That's always been my theory on why London is actually really good to cycle in, is that there are so many cyclists that y- you can't be a driver and not pay attention to them. And no. I guess it's the, it's the same principle, isn't People it? People are so used to seeing them. Mm-hmm. So um, it, that, that was nice. And then it only got better and better as we went into rural Vietnam, where most people don't end up going. If they do a, you know, the tourist trail in Vietnam, you can see all the main cities and the main uh, Hoi An where you can get a suit made and things like that. Uh, and we weren't in any of that for a good couple of weeks. And it was just beautiful, incredible scenery with the friendliest people, massive language barrier, but you just make it work. And it was a thing that we'll just remember forever and ever. One ride in particular, and this is, <laughs> Emily, you're going to, uh, probably have the same opinion you do with the Death Valley thing. We w- cycled down this small road, which became a small path, which became a walking trail with more and more shrubbery in front of us until we were just in the middle of a forest pulling like a jungle. It's literally a jungle. Pulling the foliage out the way. Um, we all lost each other and then Lawrence got a puncture and then we were just stuck in a jungle lost. Oh, great. But yeah, that was the best day. Very quickly, do you want to mention your worst ones? Yeah, definitely. I know what your worst one is. We attempted to bike pack from Alicante in southern Spain to Barcelona, the north, east Spain. I can't remember how far it was. It's it was south of Alicante. Barcelona. No, no, it's not, is it? It's north. No. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's north of Alicante. <laughs> It's I think because uh, I'm a map spinner. It? I think the plan was 600k ish, 500 600k in seven days or something like that. That was yeah, the plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was I conservative th- amount. It was going to be just like a fun thing to film some other bits along the way. We we're going to film some other videos. I think we just finished day four. I think it was so we were 400k in. 
I'm pretty sure I got heat stroke on day one and then was just riding the wave ever since. And then day four, for whatever reason, I ended up incredibly ill and I thought I was going to die. And it was uh, unbelievably unpleasant. And then we spent 300 euros on a taxi to Barcelona. Well, you definitely had food poisoning of some sort. Yeah. Does that go hand in hand with heat stroke? Does heat stroke make you more susceptible to getting ill? In theory, Ooh. I think it's possible it could have just been heat stroke. Possible. Well, yeah. Because I, I think that is one of the things heat stroke can do to you. Bearing in mind it was like winter 20, 20 in degrees Spain. in winter. Yeah. <laughs> it was warm, mind, but yeah. For, for, for whatever reason, I was furiously ill for, I think we ended up staying in that hotel for three days and then just about had the confidence to get the 300 euro taxi to Barcelona. And then, and then that was the end of the trip. And a couple of times you've said, we should get you to Barcelona. Like you wanted to do it again. And yes, I want to do it I again. usually just say no. My worst ride ever is, it was bad and good. Cycling across Australia, which was almost like cycling on a treadmill. The whole way across, there was there was there was some there was a couple of days where there was variety and it was actually very beautiful. Like cycling out of Adelaide, really good. Um, I think it's like Norton's Road or the Norton's. I think there's a famous one, and they use it in the Tour Down Under around all, all around Adelaide, and that was great. But the majority of the days were cycling on one road with like me trying to not look at how long was left. 200K days, 200 to 250K days we were doing. And I didn't want to look at the distance we were doing because it I, it cracks me. So I often turn off my bike computer or put my bike computer in my pocket or hide the screen. And unfortunately, there's markers on the side of the road which tell you every single 10 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't even trick myself in that way. That is hell to And me. it was headwind 15 out of 20 days. Strong headwind. So I hid it behind Chris. Um, and it was savage. However, again, looking back, it's kind of cool. So glad I've done that. Time for another round of overrated or underrated. I'm going to read out a list of stuff and you're going to tell me if they're overrated or underrated. This is suggested by a listener, Chris, the first one, foam rollers. Overrated. Uh, un underrated, I would say. I would say over. Why? Because they're horrible. They hurt you, or I just don't see the point in them. You're using it wrong. I don't. I don't use a foam roller. I have tried it a few times. I don't use it. I don't need it. Okay, overrated. I think they're a very cheap and useful tool, but you don't need to do it all the time. But when you do have a problem, like I get that, like my neck. Remember a while ago, I got a little sore neck. That's age. And then that's Chris Froome and age foam, foam rolled the rest of my back it was all linked and then felt really great. And that was what, like my foam roller is just like 10 quid. What great. I think is underrated is a regular high quality sports massage. And yes, I know it costs more money. It costs a lot more money. That's not accessible for everybody. I, well, no, not for everybody, but I think that is underrated. Mm. Because okay. it's targeted and specific and it's a, an expert which actually goes, oh, wait, there's something going on here. I can deal with that. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of people will not have access to that. And I think the foam rollers, as long as you don't overdo it, it's a thing which is accessible, pretty easy to do, hard to mess up. And it isn't hard to mess you up. Think people will I think people can mess themselves up more than they realize. I can add to that. My mum is a um, podiatrist and sports massager remedial massage masseuse and she actually deals with a lot of uh sports related injuries she sees a lot of people who actually have hurt themselves using stuff like foam rollers either from overdoing it or just you don't actually need the f what a foam roller relies on is the full weight of you and sometimes that's just too much what she would recommend is a tennis ball up against a wall in the area that you need because then you can um D define the pressure so tennis ball tennis ball and yeah. not not every single day 
if I was to get a massage off her, she will not massage me for another ideally two weeks. Wow. Basically, you're breaking down muscles. So you have to let it repair itself. Otherwise, you're constantly breaking it down and breaking it down and breaking mm. it down. You can do a lot of damage. I think people do get carried away with them. I can understand why some people would think they are overrated for that reason. They're definitely... Some people, on like on training camps years ago, you used to go and there'd always be a guy who like does his ride and then every single day after the ride, he spends half an hour on a foam roller, like absolutely blitzing his muscles. And there are, you know, guys racing at super high level who don't do any of that at all. So I, I, there's probably something in between, but I can see how it gets out of hand. People get addicted to using it. Mm -hmm. Suggested by Brian, cycling mitts, the fingerless ones. I would probably say underrated. Um, it's cool to not wear gloves, but gloves protect your hands. Is it cool to not wear gloves? Yes. Why? Because people think it's cool to not wear gloves. Do they? I very rarely wear gloves unless it's cold, and then it's full finger gloves. If I'm racing track mitts, you call them track, we call them yeah, track, track mitts. Track so, mitts, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would usually wear them racing because if you like, there's a much higher chance you're going to crash in a race mm -hmm. than normal riding. Like, well, unless you go riding with Nick Vieri on gravel, but then you wear mitts for that as well. So it's uh, the situation appropriate, isn't it? You choose if it's likely you're going to have a crash, probably wear some mitts. The mad thing I found is I watch a lot of mountain bike YouTube. None of them wear gloves. And that's just the dumb thing. But is that well? It must it's cool. be because it's like trendy. It's yeah, cool, it but be. it's it's just it's just stupid. Especially riding off road. Mm. Off road is like the space, and I mean like gravel as well. Like that's a space that you should always wear full finger gloves. Because full finger. Well, yeah, because the the likelihood of you sliding out is relatively high, and therefore protect your hands. When I do off road rides around here, or even in our countries, like mountain biking or gravel stuff, I always wear full finger gloves because mainly for the bushes and stuff, scraping your hands. It's like a bunch of thorns and you're dragging your hands through that. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't wear gloves, you end up with actual cuts all over your hands. Yeah. Um, if you look at the pro mountain bikers, pro cross country riders, a lot of them, particularly in stage races, they're full finger gloves all the time. And that is the way. Sorry. However, if I do a road ride and it's not cold, no gloves. It's unlikely I'm going to have a crash. I guess the other reason that people potentially wear them is for like additional support because some of them are for me, but I've always found that worse. Like yeah. if, if the form's not exactly right for you, it's like a pad, isn't it? it, it I think it's something that's quite um, personal. And sometimes, it, I don't know, I feel like it makes my hands go more numb. But I get a lot of um, like calluses and blisters just off the, I, I don't know why, but if I'm on a long road ride, I get a blister. So I usually wear a glove to just stop me getting a blister, but with no padding yeah it's, it's a little it bit just depends what happens to you doesn't it so i found that's a little bit bike fit but also it's conditioning like you i definitely have calluses on my hands when i do long rides despite my bike fit being fairly good i mean when my bike, bike fit's fit terrible I'm, I'm i ride a bike that's too big for me oh, okay so well, that, that is yeah. why so it's probably it's a contributing <laughs> thing however even with the perfect bike fit if you're riding your bike for five hours a day you're going to get, you're not designed to do that. Yeah. Like there's always going to be some adaption from your body. And I end up with, when I was racing, I always had the calluses on my hands. It's just how it is. Alp Duez. Overrated? I think overrated. I don't really know anything about it, to be honest. It's, it's a, beautiful. It's a famous climb. It's I've, beautiful. I've not like, ridden it. Don't get me wrong. It's beautiful and an incredible climb and worth riding at some point in your life. And it's a great part of France. However, it is overrated just because of the hype. It's, the, it's just a switchback climb and there are, nicer climbs out there is, is Alpe d'Huez the one that's got like the white stuff gravel at the top or something like that or like a tower or something rather? no that's a Vontu oh, okay yeah so I would suggest I prefer Vontu over Alpe d'Huez mm. I think it's more of a more of an exciting unique landscape and I would rather ride it than Alpe d'Huez having done both lots of times I don't know really anything about it I don't care yeah. about it cars overrated overrated they're great fun and they're very useful, but they are overrated. Mm. There are many scenarios that we do not need them. Many, many. Occasionally, I find myself in situations where I do need one. I don't drive or have a car. Probably will at some point. Do you want to know who else doesn't have a car? I've survived this long. My best friend, Perry. Really? <laughs> yeah. 
What does he do? He rides bikes. He rides bikes everywhere. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, you know, cargo bike, riding bikes, trains, buses, all of these things. Well, trains don't work. Done do correctly. Trains don't work very well. But yeah, overrated. Overrated. If you ask the world what they think of cars, they'll go, they are completely and utterly essential to absolutely everything. However, they have only existed for no point no 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 one of civilization and therefore they're not important. It's sad how much the world is geared towards cars. Particularly in America. It really stands out. Yeah. It's hard to do things without a car. There was a point where I cycled across America with Justin. He's a wheelchair user. And the only way we could get well, the only way we could get to the restaurant near our very cheap motel that we stayed in one night in the middle of America somewhere was walking and pushing down a slip road of a motorway and then like lifting him over the, a curb along some grass, which you can't use a wheelchair on probably, and then into the restaurant. And then on the way back, the sun had set. Like obviously, we, we knew we'd had to get back, but we needed to eat. And there was other than asking someone for a lift back to the motel, which was, as the crow flies, like 300 meters away. And we had to walk back up the thing. <laughs> it was pitch black. And I had a, my phone with a light on it and cars coming towards us. There's no, there's no pavement. It doesn't sound very safe to me. I'm not safe at all. It's stupid. What's next on the list? Podcasts. Lol. <laughs> uh, overrated. I don't know how big the podcast world is. It's, it's huge. massive, right? There's so like many bigger podcasts. than radio. Oh, 100%. <laughs> I should know these things. Um, well, then it's correctly rated. Why? Jimmy doesn't listen to podcasts. No, you don't really, do you? I don't listen to podcasts. I don't watch YouTube. I, I don't do a lot of the stuff that I probably should do. Well, that p- people would probably expect me to do. Yeah, it's more that, isn't it? Yeah. It was like that question the other day. So it was like, we had a comment on the hill climb video saying, um, I can't believe you didn't know who Andrew Feather was. Um, he's all over GCN, like basically a presenter, and he posts his Strava KOMs. It's like, we don't use Strava. And as much as I love the guys from GCN, I don't watch GCN. What I do end up doing when I'm at home is I treat podcasts, like m- historically people would have treated, like my dad treats radio. So I, I mm-hmm. always pop a podcast or a playlist from my favorite podcast on. Uh, you like your diary of a CEO. I like diary of a CEO. I, I'm listening to some of those Off at the menu, moment. Off menu, I like a lot. Yeah. There's one called Secret Confessions that I like a lot. Comedy podcasts. Comedy stuff. Yeah, yeah. You listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to loads. I've always, I'm a very auditory learner. Mm-hmm. It literally, like my perfect style of learning is just sitting and someone speaking at me, which is most people's. Rather than thing. reading a thing. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if if I'm reading, I'm focusing on, oh, I should, I should be retaining this. Like yeah. I'm not, I'm not l- listening at all. Information goes into your brain. Is it in a completely different way? Yeah, it? totally. Yeah. Podcast, definitely. I learn loads from them and I often listen to the same podcast twice. If it's something I'm really interested in. Do you? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I'll do it again. I'm like, oh, I'm making dinner tomorrow. And I'm going to listen to that again. And just like let it really sink in. But that's the way, you know, hit some people, if people read a lot, reading the same book or reading the same page twice is, is a useful thing to do. Like you don't want it to just disappear out of your brain yeah. if it's something valuable. See, much like my best mate Peridur from Pendulum. <laughs> I just, I'm, music's my thing. How do you say his name? Peridur. Say it slowly, really slowly, loudly. Pera de. Pera de. Ap. Ap. Gwyneth. Gwyneth. That's his full name. Yeah. Which is a very traditional Welsh name. Like very, very. So yeah, much like me and my best mate, I'm a music person. I always listen to music. So even like in the morning, I will go down, put the kettle on. And before I've even put the kettle on, I'll have connected to one of my Bluetooth speakers and I'll be playing some kind of obscure metal or something rather. I like saving my music listening for music listening where i'm like concentrated on it why not as background noise um i i get tired of it in the background i'm like oh it's the, like, i'd rather either be listening to it or it's off or a, a, just a radio voice podcast voice so do you do you walk around your house with your house silent um yeah yeah weird <laughs> You can email us your own overrated or underrated choices to wildonespodcast.kdmedia.co.uk. So please do that. We love seeing them. Send us some stuff, please. 
and we might give you a shout out. Time for Fluff Up of the Week. I've been trying to go to London for two weeks now. First, there was Storm Babette. Second, there was Storm Kieran. Was it Kieran? Whatever the other storm was. Stuff has blown all over my garden, but more important than that, the trains have been cancelled. First week, I was trying to go to London, see my parents, and the bottom of my road was completely flooded, so the taxi couldn't get through, take me to the train station. How come I managed to get to London and back in the last two I weeks? honestly don't know. How did you do that? I got on the train, for a start. <laughs> you, fine. you usually just have to get on the train. If you don't get on it, you can't get what there. What day did you leave? Thursday. You left earlier. <laughs> I did have to come back early on Friday because there was like half of the trains cancelled. You manage these things. <laughs> it's annoying me because I haven't been home in a long time now. So that's the fluff up. Well, you are home. This is home. This is home. True. Mm. Home away from home. Original home. OG home. OG home. Should we finish with the listener's takeover, Francis? Let's finish up with the listener's takeover. Question from Ed. Go. It's a short question. Usually they're like three paragraphs long. If you could only listen to one song again for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Thanks, Ed. This is honestly the worst question anyone could ever ask me. <laughs> I already know my answer. But... This, this is like hell to me, a question like this. Mm. Be, like at any given time, I might be listening to, uh, I do listen to a lot of music on repeat, but I'll like listen to something like very intensively for a couple of weeks and then I'll move on to something else and I'll listen to that very intensively and I'll move on to something else. Do you want to know mine? Yeah, go on, do it. I, my theory... Having thought about this for at least 10 seconds. Can I just say, before you go into it, I know this is going to be something stupid. It's not stupid. Go it's p- uh, logic. Yeah, okay, Scientific sure. logic. Yep, defo. <laughs> any song, you, any normal song that you choose is going to be a bad choice because it's going to suck because they're all like three minutes long. They're not long enough and then they're going to get repetitive and then they're going to drive you crazy. And even your favorite song in the world is going to become hell. Therefore, my choice would be the longest song I can currently think of right now which is tubular bells. Yeah, cool. Great one. Yeah. Because <laughs> this is really long and yeah. it's progressive and it changes and there's lots of different sections. You could just listen to little bits every now and then, couldn't you? Yeah. And yeah. it would be, it's the most logical choice. I'm sure people could come up with like really long pieces of classical music, which would be even better. I don't know my classical music very well, so I can't. Is tubular bells the one that's on Home Alone? No. Oh, okay. I don't think so. I haven't really it's seen Home Alone. Well, it's not that one. No. Oh. <laughs> That's a Christmas song. Okay. It's not a Christmas song. Is it The Exorcist? No, it sounds, there's a there's a bit that sounds a bit like it, isn't there? Unfortunately, we can't play it for copyright reasons, but mm-hmm. let's just look it up quickly. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is on The Exorcist. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, you're a weirdo, aren't you? But it starts off scary and then it gets, no, it gets less scary the longer you go. But so, there you go. So many emotions and things to think about. On your desert island. Is that where we are? No. That no, just says re- the rest of your life. That yeah. is a terrible suggestion. Um, <laughs> and I knew it was going to be something stupid and hideous like that. And uh, yeah, cool. What's yours, Jimmy? Better than yours. So I've, tr- I've attempted to make a short list of some of my favorites. Banned. I, You're allowed to choose one. And I, I'm going to give you my short list because I think people like music. So some people will probably appreciate this little Perry list. will appreciate this, Jimmy, I'm sure. My best mate, Perry. Oh, friends. I haven't, I haven't put a pendulum song on the list doesn't want to seem too keen but i have got a recording of perry just like talking to me that is my favorite song that i just put on loop did you know you were recording him uh no you were filming yeah don't. Secret, secret camera yeah yeah, secret yeah. so my i, I made a, a short list of songs that i listen that are probably some of my most listened to songs and i'm going to pick one from it uh judith by a perfect circle leprous's song out of here tesseract's song king poruno cabeza by Horatio Riviera. Oh, that is actually good. Uh, because it was in the film True Lies. Mm-hmm. Uh, exit movie for a film, Radiohead. Because that is like proper prog. Love it. Sweet Little Angel by B.B. King. Uh, Marigold by Periphery. Selenium Forest by Polini. Just Another Story by Jamiroquai, which falls into your category that it's basically like four songs in one. Shortlist is supposed to be short. This is, believe me, this is a shortlist. Uh, and them by Niels, F- I can't, I don't know his surname. From farm, fra, farm. And no um, one knows what you're talking about anyway, so it's fine. I'm going to go with. Oh, I can't pick. <laughs> pick Jimmy. That's a playlist. <laughs> it's one song for the rest of your life. That's the, that's why it's a hard question. This is the worst game in the world. 
pick or Francis will pick for you. Have you got one, Emily? I've got one. All right, you do yours and I'll, I'll, I'll try and pick one out of this list. Okay. The Sims theme song. The Zwift entry music. Jesus. That's actually quite good. Answer. <laughs> mine is, and it's it's mine for a couple of reasons. Mine is Teenage Dirtbag by Wheatus. Oh my goodness. You That is literally one of the, oh my God, what? The reason is, it's not my favourite song because I went the same route as you, Francis. If you pick your favourite song, it, it, it's going to curse your favourite song. I would rather remember my favourite song with love and just sing it to myself and be like, God, that's just such a banger. The way we've looked back at our favourite ri rides with rose-tinted glasses, they're not poisoned. So Teenage Dirtbag by Wheatness by Wheatus is not my favourite song. However, I recently rediscovered it via a YouTube video by Vice where it was like the making of the song. I got suggested this and it's like, it's really good. What about, yeah, I haven't and do you know what it reminded me? That it is a banger of the song. And also it was so big in this country. It was on the radio constantly and it was on music channels constantly. And what that tells me is I have listened to that song a lot on repeat and be, it's been forced upon me and I haven't got sick of it. And therefore I know that I could withstand listening to that song over and over again. Did you know that they are not famous or they'd like that's it was massive here and it was massive in Europe and they were like nobodies in America. Oh, they were, really? Th th it never got big in America. It was so big here. Did it not get used in American Pie? No, I think it was a different thing with Jason Big in. It wasn't American Pie though because he was in the music video as well. Yeah. So the music video looks like American Pie, but it's actually not. Yes. Right. Music video is great as well. I d it's just, it's there's something about it. That's terrible. Yeah, and also good, but it's, you know, I wouldn't be listening to it every day on repeat. It's a guilty pleasure though, isn't it? That verse in the middle way, yeah. he does the girl's voice I and it's like, yeah. Tickets to it is a very good piece of pop music, but I definitely wouldn't want to hear that for the rest of my life. I've picked my song. Go on. And practically no one is going to know what it is. Uh, the song King by Tesseract. I know what that is. Yeah. I don't like it. Emily will know what it sounds like. Which means uh, if, you, if, that, if we have to stick to these rules, I can never come to your house because you're having that playing in the background. But you wouldn't be able to hear it. That's the real. You wouldn't not be able to hear it because you can only listen to your song. I have to wear earplugs. Yeah. So here's an example of Emily being an audit, auditory learner. I do not know all of the words to the song King by Tesseract, whereas I bet Emily does. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what it goes like, but if you turn it on, I'll sing all the words to you because yeah. I'll have heard it before. Yeah. That's all for today's episode. Remember, you can send us your funny stories, questions, or any other stuff to wildonespodcast at kdmedia.co.uk. Not all stuff, though. Not weird stuff. Please don't send that. Subscribe, follow, and leave a review because it really helps, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, guys. Bye. Enunciate. Tip of the tongue, teeth and the lips. <laughs>